My name is Karen Tucker, and I am the CEO and a board member of the Churchill Club. Tonight's program is From Cell Phones to Software and Services, one-on-one -on -one with Nokia's CEO. Our lead sponsor, Forum Nokia, is here tonight with five of its top developers, and um, they are the developer relations and initiatives arm of Nokia, and we should thank them very much for their support this evening. At least some of you might be wondering, where is Walt Mossberg? Uh, Walt was originally scheduled to moderate this evening's program, and unfortunately, due to bronchitis, he was unable to travel to be with us, and so Rich Carlgaard was gracious to step in, and he is here instead this evening. And of course, you'll hear more about Rich and our guest of honor, Oli Pekka Kalasvuo, in a moment. Uh, but first, here's a brief set of Churchill announcements about our next few programs. Um, recently, we have seen plenty of irrational behavior, whether in politics or the world of finance, and so we decided to put a program together for our members on this topic, and we've recruited Ori Broffman and Ron Broffman, the best-selling authors of the business book, Sway, to come and talk with us about this topic and perhaps help us understand better how such things can happen. And Guy Kawasaki will moderate that program. Uh, next, on October 27th, we present Sam Wiley, the self-made billionaire, business and technology billionaire that started with $1,000 and an idea, and well-known venture capitalist Dixon Dahl will moderate. And finally, in this election year, uh, in which new media has played such an enormous role, we present Politics 2008, Sound Bites, Spin, and the Search for the Facts. And this panel discussion will present Paul Jay, the CEO of the Real News Network, Steve Grove, who is head of news and politics at YouTube, uh, Deborah Perry Pishoni, who is a longtime political commentator, and Ray McGovern, who did the White House briefings for 27 years as a CIA analyst turned political activist. And that will be moderated by Matt Furman, head of corporate communications at Google. Uh, one final announcement. If you are not a member and you do enjoy tonight's program, we do encourage you to consider joining us and enjoying the many benefits of a formal relationship with the club. Uh, individual membership is just $125 and corporate memberships start at $1,000. The Churchill Club is a nonprofit organization and of course that means that we do rely on the support of our members. And if this is of interest to you, we would love to have you join us. Just talk to any of the board, staff, or volunteer uh, folks here this evening, or visit our website at churchillclub.org. So now onward to the main event. Tonight, the Churchill Club presents From Cell Phones to Software and Services, one-on-one -on -one with Nokia's CEO. Our moderator is Rich Carlgaard, publisher of Forbes. America's most popular business and technology magazine. Rich writes a monthly Forbes column called Digital Rules, and you can also read his daily blog on the homepage of Forbes.com. Uh, he is the author of Life 2.0, How People Across America Are Transforming Their Lives by Finding the Where of Their Happiness, a, an Amazon.com and Wall Street Journal bestseller, business bestseller, and among his many other achievements, Rich, uh, together with Tony Perkins, co-founded the Churchill Club back in 1985. Um, and for their work in founding the club, they were co-awarded the Ernst & Young Northern California Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Rich, it's such a pleasure to have you back. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. Uh, gosh darn it, Walt, bronchitis? I mean, the bar is pneumonia at Forbes. <laughs> it's great to be uh, back at the Churchill Club, and especially tonight, as I was um, doing my 10 minutes of research for this interview. Actually, Walt Mossberg was extremely helpful in bringing me up to speed on uh, the product side of uh, so important for our discussion tonight. But uh, I have a 
found a little piece of trivia you might be interested in, and that's the year the electromagnetic spectrum was discovered. Anybody want to take a guess? 1866. Now, here is a company that has built a whole its business on, uh, on products that use the electromagnetic spectrum. So when do you think Nokia was started? It was started the year before, in 1865. That's really, that's real patience. I think only the Finns can have that kind of uh, patience and visions to start a company the year before the electromagnetic spectrum is, was discovered. But it was, uh, of course, launched as a paper mill company. And over the ensuing 140 years, it's been in everything from rubber boots to wire, cable, tires, televisions, and personal computers. Uh, but we're here to talk about uh, cell phones and mobile devices and, and how that's so, become so exciting particularly exciting here in Silicon Valley with the iPhone and the Android and WiMAX out of Intel. Uh, it's really the, it, it, this very interesting intersection of um, the cell phone and the pocket computer. Uh, but I also want to talk about this great corporate culture that Nokia has developed, one that you probably haven't heard too much about, um, uh, but, but one that our guest tonight, Oli Pekka Vuo, uh, really presides over a very innovative culture from a country of only five million people. In some ways, it resembles a Silicon Valley company, in many ways not. So we're going to have a discussion both about, about uh, the opportunity in uh, the mobile device market and the, the, the interesting intersection and clashing of platforms, but also this idea of corporate culture. Uh, our guest tonight joined Nokia in 1980 uh, as corporate counsel. So this is great hope for all of you wastrel lawyers out there. You can make something of your life. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you listen to tonight's uh, guest, he'll, he'll tell you how to do it. And you finance people. Uh, you too uh, can make something of your life because after he left uh, general counsel at Nokia, um, more interested in the business side, that he went through the post of chief financial officer to get to the uh, CEO position in um, 2006. So let's give a warm Churchill Club welcome to Oli Pekka Kalas Vuo, known as OPK. Uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about this um, global juggernaut with 40% market share in cell phones across the world uh, uh, from a country of 5 million people from a suburb of Helsinki that not so many people know about in, in any kind of an intimate way. Everybody knows Nokia, but may not know uh, much beyond that and the fact you produce uh, cell phones. Tell, tell, us, tell us what makes Nokia unique. Well, the company is unique. You are right, Rich. And in that way, we basically understood early on we don't have a home market. And if you are 5 million people only, you don't have a domestic market. You have to expand. You have to go abroad. You have to become global. And that's what we decided to do. And uh, I, I can tell you, probably we are today the most global company there is looking at any major corporations in the world. Very global when it comes to management. You know, I'm, I'm a Finn, obviously, but uh, I'm not that representative anymore of the management. My CFO, he's American, is based out of New York. My CDO, Chief Development Officer, is based out of New York as well, and in that way, I mean, typically, you know, your, your CFO is in the next office, and you go there and raise the money. <laughs> in my case, there's the Atlantic Ocean between the two of us. And that's when he says, I can't hear you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> and, and, and in that way, it's, it, it, it helps a lot if you don't have a home market. But never, nevertheless, I, I, like, I, like you said, I joined in 1980. It was love at first sight, and we are very proud of what we have, what we have created here. In fact, I'm almost the employee number one now in terms of years of service in the company. 
and it's quite interesting. The people are not the same as when I joined in 1980. The company is the same. And uh, in fact, there is something, something greater, something deeper in, 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 it is in what is known as an enterprise, as only the people, as only the, 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 the people who are there currently. Well, what is that thing? Because I think the challenge that many companies have throughout the world, that if they've had success, that they can become wedded to their success, that they become married to their processes, that they become fixed in their ways. And uh, how, do you, how do you carry the culture forward from a company that's been around since 1865 and still keep it innovative? I think a lot of people are trying to find that holy grail. Mm -hmm. Well, I think any company that is big and has been successful has some amount of, uh, some, some, some complacency in there. I mean, it's, it would be, it would be uh, not right to, to admit that. That's quite clear. Question is how much and how actively you tackle complacency, arrogance, uh, and how, how actively you try and maintain speed, flexibility, customer responsiveness. It's a big challenge to any big successful company. And you know, that's something, that's a battle that you never win, but you have to fight it every day. And I think uh, we are very, very committed doing that. Maintaining a small company spirit and soul in a, in a big corporate body, basically. Well, how do you um, how do you hold people responsible? Well, people take the responsibility. They 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 take they they take their roles if if you, you if you empower them. Of course, in business, responsibility is there and has to be there. It, you know, this is not a free ride. But at the same time, I believe in a culture where you can take risks and fail and uh, not be punished for that. But of course, you cannot fail forever. That's, that's very yeah. clear. <laughs> well, you've been at the company for 28 years. What, describe some major inflection points along the way where the company really had to come to terms with changes in the marketplace or opportunities to pursue and maybe made uh, bigger risks than usual. Yeah, yeah, and there, there have been many, of course. It, it's, it's the way it goes. Sometimes you have to make big decisions and, uh, and change the company radically. And that's what we did in the early 90s. We decided basically to divest uh, most of our businesses and concentrate on telecommunications at that point of time. Later on, even, even mobile telephony. But, uh, you know, I... Having said that, I still believe companies need to change through an evolution rather than a revolution. And it's the changes, con continuous change every day, every day, small steps or baby steps and evolution. That uh, if you can maintain that type of mentality, you can continue to change without making a revolution every now and then. But here, I think it's extremely important as well that you, you are able to offload stuff. If you take new stuff on board, new ways of working, new technologies, new business models, you have to be able also to say goodbye to stuff or things that have served you well. And that's, uh, that's very often painful. And, uh, but a, a key in making the continuous change to happen. Well, it's interesting as uh, when we founded the Churchill Club in 1985, Intel was going through the process of divesting itself from the memory chip business, and it was a very difficult decision for it to make. And it came to a point where Gordon Moore said, um, if we, were, if we uh, weren't in the memory chip business today, would we get in it? Uh, because the margins yeah. were eroding, and it was going to Japan, and from there it would go to Korea. And, uh, and everybody around the room said no. And so he said, why don't we all walk through the door and then walk back in the door and we're a different company. We don't have it anymore. I mean, did, when you divested yourself of the other non-mobile phone businesses in the early 90s, was it out of opportunity or a crisis? Both, uh, I would say, in, in, in that way. Of course, crisis always, always helps company, companies to change, no doubt about that. 
and quite often only crises can help a company to change, a big company. But that's why I'm talking about this mentality. And I, I mean, that decision and that question Gordon Moore made there, I mean, that's absolutely the right one. And basically what he was saying, you need to question and challenge what you are doing on a continuous basis. And uh, that's not always that easy. People tend to defend their positions. People tend to say, well, this is what we have been doing. And uh, I remember one incident. We were having a, a management meeting. This is like five or six years ago, well, maybe four or five years ago. And there's a proposal. Somebody proposes that we are going to do something like, th something like this. People look at him and say, we don't do that. And I said, why not? And then there was a lot of discussion there until somebody said, we have been, so in, we have been saying no to this proposal for so long that we have forgotten why, why we started saying no in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this, this um, I think, uh, at least to me, that was a big learning in the way that, you know, organizations tend to learn to maintain the status quo and you really need to challenge that very, very actively. And I'm, I'm saying on a, on a continuous basis and not every now and then only. What's your management style? How, how did, what, what is a week in the life of your schedule? You must, uh, uh, being from a small country uh, and yet having a 40% global market share, over 50% in India, um, scattered all over around the world at a time when the take-up of mobile devices has just has really been the technology story of this decade. Uh, where uh, where do you go? I mean, how, how often do you travel? Are you on the road continuously? Yeah, I, I, I am. But and, and let me let me comment on that. On the, when you when you're saying that you know the the mobile mobile devices market has grown rapidly. Before I I, I sort of kind of respond to you. So it's very interesting if you look at the the number of the first. 1 billion subscribers in the world in, in, mobile, in mobile telephony. One, first 1 billion. It, it took 20 years to make that 1 billion happen. Second billion, 4 years. Third billion, 2 years. And now we are heading towards the fourth billion, and that's going to happen some, sometime next year. Think about that. 4 billion people. It's, it's a mind-boggling number, and if you, especially if you remember that 6.5 is the total number, uh, to, the total population in, on the Earth. So the world is big, a lot of activity else, uh, everywhere. You need to be there, and uh, I believe you need to uh, quite actively travel and, uh, and, and see what is happening. Uh, but, you know, the management style, everybody has, has his, own, his or her, so her just, own just style, and I'm, t I'm simply saying that it's, I see a lot of Nokia faces here, and you know, it's kind of, <laughs> I might be contested if I start discussing my management style. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit on a thin ice here, right? But, but any, nevertheless, you know, you spend 200 days plus on, on the road, and, uh, and, and that, that is a lot. So I'm almost more in the U.S. than, uh, than in Europe. Well, the, the, the question is, how do you bring those two together? You're uh, being on the road 200 days a year, plus your need to manage the company. Do you have very strong lieutenants and give them a lot of space, or, or how, how does that work? Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, uh, there are, I think there are, there are two ways uh, to think about this. One. Of course, possibility is that, you know, you've got your, your campus in Cupertino or in Seattle and you are all there. And you, and you basically, the team is there together all the time. You have the Monday morning meetings, right? Where everybody is, you know, you have to be there. But uh, then, on the other hand, the world is big, the markets are global, the competition is global, and unless you learn to work together as a company, as a team, in a situation where you are traveling all the time, you are based in different places, I mean, you are missing some of that. 
and you know technology is allowing us to keep in contact all the time and I, be, I believe you know big companies will have to be able to to kind of manage in a virtual way more and more as opposed to all being together in Cupertino. <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, uh, just a couple more questions on this culture and management style and then we'll move, yes. move more toward uh, this, you know, this clash of platforms and this really exciting. Yeah, to the, to, to, to the more expected question. To the more expected, to the Walt Moss. <laughs> to the, I'm just marking time and then I'll ask the Walt Mossberg questions which he gladly supplied me with. But, um, <laughs> because he knows this field. Uh, do you, uh, where, it's not like in Finland that you have a lot of comparable, that you grew up looking at a lot of great Finnish global giants and could learn from them. Therefore, um, you know, you, you must have to look at the world as your university and see, look at companies that are managed well, look at companies that are not, companies that have stayed innovative even as they've grown big. Yeah. Uh, companies that have stagnated. How, how do you, uh, what, 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 what sort of hero companies and CEOs uh, have you had? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and one thinks about that, that a lot. And, and, and two, no two companies are alike. So in that way, the good comparables are, are difficult to find. You know, everybody is in their own, own situation and the business dynamics are different and so forth. And uh, Maybe being here in the valley, I don't, I'm not going to choose any, any local companies here. And I, uh, but, um, so I, I would like to take one, one, one company that I admire up and, uh, and that's, this is apl applicable to the CEO as, as well and that is Procter and Gamble. I, I, I believe the way they have changed the company, the way they AG have- A.G. Laffley. Uh, A.G. Laffley as the CEO. The way they have been op able to harness open innovation and, uh, and, and uh, yes, yes, partly become exposed because of that. You know, always openness means that you are exposed. You've got less shelter, you've got less uh, hiding places, but you can harness open innovation. And I think the, this, is the, this, is the, this is the company that's, that's done that in a very, very good manner. And uh, the results speak for, for themselves. I think it's, it's a company to watch, watch even if you are in a technology industry or, or, or this type of technology industry we are in. Open innovation, we've been trying at Nokia to, to move to that direction. Many people here know that we are far on that road, but they also know that we've got a lot to do there when it, when it, when it, comes, to, when it comes to being able to harness, like I said, uh, opening up, partnering in a better way, becoming partly exposed as well, and then getting the results. And as we will discuss later, later, I'm sure, <laughs> the question will be there, uh, what we are doing with Symbian, the Symbian operating system, the way we are open sourcing that, now in order to, 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 uh, to harness open innovation, that's a good example. And you this. mean beyond just open source uh, coding, you mean, uh, op I mean, the way you stated it, implies a broader way. I mean, it, Procter & Gamble belo actually belongs to a consortium it helped start it called Innocentive, where they post problems to be solved by anybody, uh, problems that their own R&D can't solve, and, and uh, occasionally they'll get great ideas and, and pay a person a cash prize for solving how to get toothpaste in a tube in a more efficient way. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, let's not limit like the, uh, this, this openness, open innovation, uh, outsourcing innovation kind of, let's not, let's, let's not limit that to coding and, 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 and software. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger concept, it's, uh, it's much, uh, much more important and I, I believe it sort of requires a lot of change in any big company who's gotten used to how things, how things are done. And of course, you know, the first people who, who, who oppose openness are typically the lawyers <laughs> who say that, you know, not possible, there's the IPR or IP that needs to be protected and, you know, you need to fight that one as well. Yeah, HR people. So at least people I know are... how to fight that battle. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there it helps to be, uh, have come from that background. 
Well, let's uh, move on more to the specifics of what's going on in the mobile um, market right now. You have a 40% world market share. I think what Samsung's way back and second at 20%. Um, and uh, uh, you've got some declining players like Motorola. You have some up and coming players like LG. What's, uh, what's the competitive landscape look like right now? Yeah, it's quite interesting that you are referring to what I would call our traditional competition. And it's people like, exactly like you, you were referring to. And if I look at sort of that market, I, I, what I would, I would say is can, be, can be referred to as the cell phones. <laughs> yes, the competitive dynamics have, have remained pretty much the same during the last, last 15 years. A lot of consolidation has happened in the way that many people have exited the industry because they have not been able to, to gain, gain the critical mass. And uh, the list, list is long, people who have left. Uh, Siemens, uh, BenQ being the last one. And uh, we have been gaining market share there, but getting better scale, get, uh, get more volume, more everything. And, uh, and uh, we're in the, in the second quarter of, last, of, of this year on the level of 40%. So, so in that way, and I, I believe the competitive dynamics in that business continue to pr be pretty much the same, although you cannot isolate that anymore in, in the same way. And then, of course, in, in a quite interesting manner, suddenly people that I was not referring to our competitor, as, as our competitors three or four years ago are there. Newcomers, many of them, them from here. Apple, the case in point. RIM, Google, even Google. And then, of course, Microsoft. And uh, I, I heard Steve Ballmer was here last week, and I think he, he made similar type of references <laughs> referring to, to Nokia as, as a competitor. And it's quite interesting that uh, suddenly, suddenly, in a matter of some years only, you've got the mightiest companies in this world there as your competitors. And uh, that's, that's a little bit sort of mind-boggling. It's, uh, and, uh, and, and you really have to be, uh, have, to, have to stay quite humble here, saying that, you know, it's a new game, partly. There are new rules, new business models, and it takes a lot in addition to what you have been good at in the past to compete in this new uh, world of competition or, or, or with the not that traditional competitors. It's, it's quite interesting. And I, 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 I'm taking this ma ba basically as, as an illustration of the fact that the industry we are in, in the way it's developing, is very interesting to, to people who have not been traditionally interested in this area. And that excitement, that, that possibility speaks for a great future to, to what what we, what we can refer to as, as a mobile communications in general. It's not definitely the cell phone industry we are talking about here. It's something much more. The consumers are not happy with the hardware purchase anymore. They want more. They want uh, an experience. They want a solution. We all know that the, the, the cell phone industry, let's call it, call it for the time being, in that way, has been pretty good in capturing value from adjacent industries in the past. We, the cell phone manufacturer, manufacturing mobile phones, became suddenly the biggest camera manufacturer in the world when the camera functionality was added to, to the phone. Uh, the same is applicable to the, to the music player functionality, PND, and so forth. And, uh, but but even, even that is not enough. It's not enough that the cell phone has become a multi-purpose multi device uh, with a lot of functionality. Now the consumers are wanting even more. They are, what, they, they are wanting to buy a solution. I'm, I'm, I'm using music as an example here. So it's, uh, it's not enough that there is a music playing functionality in, in, in the device more and more, co more consumers want to buy a music experience or even music. At the same time, they, they make, a, make a purchase of the device decision. 
And then we also need to add that type of sort of functionality or service or solution to the device. And I see this as a possibility to capture even more value to this industry. But at the same time, it will mean new business models, new competition but and new challenges. Now, uh, my theory is, is that, that America has been relatively slow on uh, mobile devices because we were fixated with the personal computer. Uh, and then uh, at first all the software applications for the personal computer and then the web driven era of the personal com computer and, and have been late to the game. Uh, but the game is changing. And so as you look at American companies like Apple and um, bringing this deep computer expertise into the market and you're bringing the cell phone expertise, I mean, what, how does that play out? I mean, the iPhone is a pretty small player on a market, uh, on a market percentage basis right now. And it's, you know, maybe it does too many things and I personally don't like the keyboard and so on, but you sense that this is one powerful device from one very successful company and, uh, and could real, really be a game changer. Yeah. And then, you know, and similarly with Google and, and RIM and so on. I mean, yeah. are, are, they, are they your competitors or are the, the low cost people in Asia your, are you, which one are you more worried about right now? Both. <laughs> and that's, that's always, you need to be paranoid. So you need to be, <laughs> need to be scared all the time. Yeah. Well, only the but, paranoid survive. Yeah, so I, I, by the way, believe in that a lot in, in what he said, the great man. And uh, yeah, it's both, both. But you know, it's 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 quite interesting. What, what we are seeing here is uh, is really a not not really that much the convergence between the PC and the cell phone. We are more seeing the convergence uh, of the internet and mobility, and uh, and, that, and that's very very powerful. Because what we can, what is happening here, people from the internet world, people from the mobility world are coming to the same space and uh, really looking at sort of what type of models, what type of sort of uh, heritage, I, I guess, uh, will, will prevail here. And I, I, I believe we need to become a company here that is able to, to combine the internet and mobility in the right manner. And that's what I, why I was speaking about the services and adding that functionality. And then there are other people coming to the space from another direction. Apple, maybe more like the, from, the, from, from the computer side. Google, definitely from the internet side. Microsoft, uh, from the software side. And it's quite interesting how this will play out. And uh, it's very clear that if mobility was driven by Europe in the 1990s and, uh, and definitely the US was or the North America was quite like backwaters in, in at that point of time when it came to the mobility and def equally internet was of course driven by the valley and is driven by the valley. I think the, this convergence space here, uh, I think it will be driven, what driven by, by by the US, by the valley and I see a lot of activity here and, and US as, as, be, as opposed to being a laggard, will lead this one. Well, there you go. That's a forecast. Um, that what, is a forecast, yes. Well, the, in this convergence of internet and mobility, what do you feel that you lack at Nokia? Which skill set do you have? And do you think that skill set is to be found here in the Valley with partnerships or with a more robust R&D center. Um, I mean, you, you uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be, if there's a criticism, it's that software hasn't been Nokia's strength so far, and in this uh, convergence that, that you need to be a stronger software company. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm the first one to admit that, you know, we need to be even stronger in software, and, and you know, that's in fact the theme of, the, of tonight, you know, from, from the cell phones to software and services, that speaks to that point. But then again, I look around here and I see, in fact, in the audience, many great Nokia software people as well. So let's not sort of 
forget that you know we've come a long and, way there. And, and, and you do have and, six you have six hundred people the, in Silicon Valley. Yeah, and, right? and, and and yes, and, but but definitely it's a, we, we are making making a transformation happening here again. I think we are renewing the company again, and I'm first one to admit that you know we need even more skills, people, capabilities, uh, experience, and more partnering. That's that's very very clear, and uh, that's why I'm I'm partner with service providers or software developers ma with many people. I mean, if if we think about the list of the competitors I I was referring to earlier on, I mean. It's almost my thinking goes, you know, you can, you can fight some of the people, of these people for some of the time, but not all of them for all of the time. <laughs> and in that way, the... the, the kind of reworking of Lincoln's <laughs> famous phrase, yeah. right? So, so in, that, in that way, partnering with different people, you know, the, that's a necessity here. And that's why I was speaking, speaking about also the openness and open innovation. You know, in a world that is really a convergence world from many of many mighty industries, internet, mobility, PC, software. I mean, it's very clear that there is not any company here that would be, would be able to, to, to do this alone. And that's why that type of openness is, is needed. And, uh, and uh, I think there is a lot of soul searching here happening in, in, in many companies on how, how, how to play this, how to partner, how, how, the, how will the dynamics go here. And, uh, and it's, it's very, very interesting. Well, you have to do this against, a, um, a, against a, a, a world where there are really three distinct markets and three distinct usage patterns, Europe, North America, and Asia. I mean, people in all three of those areas regard their mobile device and their expectations for what it will do quite differently, don't they? I mean, is that, is that, is that a sort of a temporary phenomenon? Do you see the convergence also? of um, how people will view their device, or do you think that Europe, North America, and Asia will remain pretty distinct markets? No, in fact, I, I, I believe there's a lot of similarity here in, in between the markets. And, 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 and one, one observation that we have been able to make now when making uh, or doing sort of a lot of consumer segmentation studying or surveying now during the last, last six months, uh, the glo global consumer, if you will, meaning consumers in different parts of the world, are increasing their involvement in, 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 with the device. Ba basically saying that the whole market is moving up when it comes to the involvement of consumers. And by involvement, I mean consumers' uh, ability and willingness, both, to, to use mobile communications in, in new ways. And I think that's good news for the industry. This is, includes very much the US and, uh, as well. And I'm, I'm the first one to, to note, even before being asked, that, I'm, uh, that Apple has, has definitely made a, made a sort of big favor to this industry, teaching and showing to, with, with the iPhone to, 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 to the U.S. and other consumers that, you know, this can be very exciting. And, and there's a lot of opportunity, and I think the whole industry will benefit from that. Well, I wrapped you a little bit on software, um, but on uh, hardware and form factors, Nokia has always been a leader. Have we seen, are we, are we really now into a division of form factors, that is, computers as small as they can get, and then this big divide until you get to the mobile device? Or is there something in between and uh, our devices like Amazon's Kindle, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, the first examples of this in-between device. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there will be an in-between market as well. And, uh, but it's, it's important to understand that at the end of the day, as technologies develop, as the processing power in small devices increases, as the power, power consumption is managed in a better way, and more efficiency can be, can, be, can, can be gotten there. So it's not anymore necessarily a technology question, whether you can, what type of devices you, you want to bring to the marketplace. It's a question about what do the consumers prefer. And I think Kindle is a, is a good, great innovation there. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a technology problem that Kindle, Kindle has, has resolved. 
it's more like a usage and uh, and uh, and ease of use type of type of matter and therefore it's uh, it's quite clear that the, at the end of the day the consumer the end user will be the king or queen here and uh, we all are going to make the decision on uh, how much screen we are uh, we are willing to carry with us because at the end of the day you know it's it's not a technology question and uh, then technologies we will even allow foldable screens that's not too far and so forth and so forth so th th there's a plenty of opportunity here here you, in, in this area you gave some earlier figures uh, demonstrating this dramatic take up of cell phones over the last 20 years 20 years to the first billion then four to the next yes. two to the next where are we now in web enabled devices what are the numbers um, that we should be looking at what are the numbers that you use internally well it's uh, now now if, if we if we if we for simplicity for simplicity this is not the market estimate i have to be very sort of careful here so if if we if we for for simplicity say that the that the, the market is somewhere close to 1 billion so which which was uh, with, uh, so so the big bulk of these devices are web enabled the big bulk and uh, and increasingly and it's it's soon that uh, that that all of them in fact will be web, web enabled and this of course opens up new interesting opportunities in markets where uh, the the pc penetration is basically non existent i i would like to take india as an example so there are millions of people there as we speak who are getting their first internet experience through mobile people who never saw or owned a pc in the way in the same way they got their first uh, first uh, telephone experience in a mobile people who never heard the dial tone and will not hear that uh, so in, in the same way they are they are getting their first first internet experience in, in a mobile and and I, I think this is a great illustration of the fact that uh, uh, this market internet the, the, the convergence of mobility and internet can, can, has a lot of legs. Well, um, one of the great accomplishments of, uh, the, that humankind has performed over the last 10 or 15 years is that we've moved a billion people from poverty into the middle class um, as, where they can afford these devices and then stay entrenched into the world middle class and, and uh, access all kinds of information and information about products and Careers and stuff that they couldn't couldn't before. So it's it's a it's a that, that just a, sort of a little advertising insertion I felt obligated to give. It's really quite a humanitarian thing that your industry has accomplished, even as it seeks you know good old capitalistic profit. Um, before I open it to questions, I just want to get your uh, um, you know come back just a little to what some of the Silicon Valley companies are doing, and just get your deep thoughts. I mean, do you like the iPhone? <laughs> I, I, you know, whether I like it or not, you know, it's that's that's. But but I definitely admire the people who made it happen. I think it's a, it's something like I said. I give Apple a lot of credit, and uh, and and I also thank Apple, you know, in a very humble manner, that they have done a service to this industry, and we've got a new credible competitor here. And, and, and that, that's great. Okay, they continue to be, for, as, uh, as we speak, or for the time being, that's more like a niche, to, looking at that globally. But nevertheless, you know, a new credible competitor in this business. And, you know, I need to take my hat off. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's well done. But, of course, you know, we need to be able to respond to any competition, and we will. Yeah. What, what, do you, uh, what do you think of Google's efforts? Yeah, it's 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 quite interesting, you know. It's uh, because they are really a newcomer here to this industry, and uh, they made the I think they made they made the Android announcement in November on the November fourth fourth of November last year, something like that. I remember that quite well because I was participating in a panel discussion in New York the next day, and one of the three panelists was Sergey Brin, 
and he got a lot of airtime, you know, I, he got a lot of airtime, and I, I, I tried to say, and I want to say this, but, <laughs> but and, I, and I realized in, in that panel that, you know, boy, you know, this is going to be something that is spoken about a lot. Uh, but I also said that in, said in that panel, uh, after, after hearing him speak, that in fact, you know, we could have made the same announcement 10 years ago when we started sort of coming to, to the operating systems and, and with our partners started, started Symbian, and, uh, which has been quite open even until now. And, uh, and you know, in, the, in that way, we have been there. Uh, they are a newcomer. We take them very seriously, uh, but you know, I think the jury is still out. What is the new thing they can bring to the party here? Uh, if, you, if you look at the operating, operating systems, you know, you've got, you've got, of course, Apple here, you've got Google here, you've got Microsoft, Frim, Palm, and then you have Symbian. And uh, if you make the comparison here, looking at what is uh, mature in terms of being there, a lot of development work there, a lot of developers and has, 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 has had that investment happen uh, for, for a long time. That's what I call maturity here, in the, in the positive sense of the word. What is mature and open, both. So I can, in fact, I can qualify only, only one, one platform approach here that, 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 that is both open and of course, all, all the Linux, Linux efforts that, that I forgot to refer to. Only one platform, one OS here is both open and mature, and that, that's Symbian. And in that way, we feel we got a very strong asset here that, that we are, like I'm, I'm sure is, is understood by many, that we are going to make completely open. So we are purchasing Symbian as a company, and then in fact giving it away and by, making it, by, by making it open. And in that way, we are going to make Symbian bigger, better, faster, and in fact, the ecosystem there, bigger, better, faster as well. And I think that that will give a lot of opportunity here in this market and uh, is something that will be quite challenging to compete against. But of course, it's an open game here and it's, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, lot of effort and, you know, this is only making this more interesting. Well, it's the game is being reinvented as we speak. I've left out of the discussion um, RIM. Um, RIM has had extraordinary success in corporate account penetration. I mean, it is almost, it really has become the de facto standard of corporate mobile email. Uh, how, how did they pull that off? And uh, can they be, can you attack them? Or is it best to tr just sort of seed that turf to them and try to poke at other, uh, poke at other areas, particularly in, in North America where your, your market share isn't so strong? Yeah, and we, are, we are definitely not, gonna, con, not going to leave them alone, vice versa. We are com going to compete aggressively in that space as well. But uh, having said that, it's quite clear, and I think this is, uh, this is a good learning here. What, what RIM has made happen is something I spoke about even earlier today, when, tonight, when I said that we are going to, inc we are going to, to, to sell solutions to, 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 to people, to consumers. And what RIM is, has been doing in a very clever manner, they did define the corporate, enter the enterprise or, or the behind the firewall, email market as something where they are providing solutions. And when you are buying a factory, you are not buying a, a device, you are buying a solution. And uh, this speaks very much to our strategy when I'm saying, we are going to make the tight service integration of several services over our device platform, over the Symbian platform. And in fact, uh, multiply what RIM has been doing here in the corporate email. And I think that's a very good example of what, what can be done when, when you add a solution to mobility or sol a solution to the mobile device. But having said that, again, you know, like I said, it's, uh, it's very clear that we will, we will stay active in that space, meaning corporate email, prosumer email, and also consumer email, which in fact has been a really an unexplored territory so far.
the enterprise class email does not really scale down from the cost point of view to consumer level. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a new market, not taken by anybody. And in fact, we made quite an interesting acquisition there. In fact, the, 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 the day before yesterday, when we announced the acquisition of, of uh, Canada-based Oz, which are a sort of me consumer messaging IM provi platform provi provider. And you know, that's, that's something that we will then, then leverage in bringing consumer email to the marketplace. And I, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity, not leaving the enterprise email uh, alone either. Let me ask one more question. This is supplied by Roger McNamee, who's uh, yes. uh, on the board of Palm, uh, led the private equity investment in Palm. And that is, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. And, and that is the whole subject of video. Uh, what, what, first of all, what, what are your bandwidth assumptions for video to really work well on a mobile device? And uh, what will people, uh, what will people want? What kind of, what, what, what are your assumptions about form factor and so on that will create the, the kind of video uh, device that is really cool uh, without sort of blowing out all the other things that it might do well too by making it too heavy or whatever, uh, too battery intensive, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an excellent question and it's, it's an ex excellent sort of topic to discuss because they are, so far there has, I don't think, the, the clear answers have been there. And in fact, when we are talking about video, I just refer to the fact that there's another sort of application or solution that has not really taken off as of yet, which, and that is mobile TV, where basically the technologies are in place the consumer take-up has not happened as China of yet. China works in South Korea, doesn't it? In, and, in, in, and in Japan. Mm -hmm. So in, in fact, the technologies are there, the possibilities are there, and, and the same is applicable to video as well. You know, the bandwidth, uh, the speeds in the network, you know, they are starting to come to the level that, you know, the video Which is... Which should be what? Well, five what? megabits per second, 10, what, what are we talking that, about? That, that's plenty. That is plenty, and if you look at look at the investments, you know have, that have been made here in the U.S. by by AT&T and Verizon, when it comes to the speed in their networks, you know we are we are we are we are quite far, and in the, in that way, the the opportunity is there. It's it, it, to some extent it's like a chicken and egg uh, question. The consumer take up does not uh, happen before there's plenty of plen there's plenty of opportunity in this area. And, uh, and, 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 and vice versa. But these both, both video and mobile TV are definitely, it's a question about time when, we, when we, that will happen. I think technologies will make that possible. So. Well, the US is, I think, sunk to 15th in the world in bandwidth per capita, so it's probably not going to happen first here. So where do you look? Uh, where, where, what are your test beds for video? Which countries um, sort of give us a hint of the future of where mobile real-time video is going to happen. Yeah, I, I would in fact claim, and I, I'm, I'm now a bit, a bit controversial or even, even disagreeing with, with what you are saying. So, so the, if I look at the US and I look at the, the way both, the, I, I, I mentioned two names only, I mean, the list is longer, but you know, I mentioned two names, both our customers uh, here, uh, AT&T and Verizon, the way they have been sort of, uh, being active with data, the way they have been adding capacity and speed in their networks, uh, they are quite progressive operators, even globally. And in, in that way, sort of, when it comes to mobile communications, not even referring to this, this internet convergence, I, I think US is quite, quite sort of uh, advanced. And uh, we all know sometimes the coverage is a bit spotty. And we, we draw the conclusion that you know the U.S. US networks are not, not necessarily that that strong. I would I would say the data data plans in the U.S. are very competitive, meaning that uh, the consumers can get a lot of data at a reasonable price. Uh, the consumer take up is happening, partly thanks to the iPhone here as well. And I see, I see a lot of possibility in the U.S. in, in this area. 
and uh, I know these these people have been have been investing quite a lot, and hence many of these things, in fact, including video and mobile TV, can really start to happen here before before any other market. So that's that's well possible. Well, good. Let's uh, let's open it up for questions. We've got roving mics, uh, so anybody who's holding a mic, uh, and we've got one over here. You you talked, you, uh, okay. Richard Lim, uh, GSR Ventures. You talked quite a bit about um, you know innovation happening here in the U.S. How do you see that happening in China? you know, which has more internet subscri uh, more mobile subscribers than anywhere else in the world, or India, which has the fastest growing, you know, base of mobile subscribers. And as you correctly pointed out, first experience with internet and telephony is on a mobile phone. Yeah, I, I don't think innovation knows any borders. So in that way, it's, it's, uh, it's of course a good question. And you know, a global company like VR need to sort of leverage and, and ex, uh, leverage innovation, uh, exploit innovation in all markets. And uh, we all know that when it comes to innovation, when it comes to new new concepts, there's nothing that is comparable to the valley. But then again, having said that, I'm and I'm I'm, I'm not wanting to take a stand here between India and, and China here. But you know, I, if I if I if I would need to pick one when it comes to new business concepts, new innovation, new possibility, I, I would mention China. A lot of activity, a lot of, of opportunity, and, uh, and uh, especially Shanghai, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be something very important here in this respect. Is that and, because yeah. the telecommunication infrastructure in India is still pretty spotty, or? I think some, some and, and this might this might not uh, not not uh, be something that you know will will continue for a long time. But somehow, the new business activity in China at the moment, if if one, if one looks at the grassroots and if, if one looks at the, what are the young people doing, it's uh, it's second to the U.S. only, in fact, and that's very very interesting and will be will be very challenging also to the Western world. Because you know, we cannot put China in a basket, saying that you know it's uh, less innovation, more, more low labor cost. No, it's 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 even even the opposite. We see a lot of innovation, a lot of possibility, and a lot of energy in China. Having said that, of course, in India as well. But you know, if I would have to pick one of the two, I would I would sort of I would look at China. Question over here. Hi, my name is, oh, excuse me, my name is Scott Wills. I'm with Highwire, a mobile TV operator here in the U.S. And you mentioned how the technology is in place for uh, mobile TV. It hasn't quite taken off yet. It seems that Nokia has made a big bet around DVB-H. And assuming the technology does take off here in the U.S. and other places, uh, where do you think Nokia will move with the technology as it stands with DVB-H versus some of the other uh, standards that are out there? Yeah, when it comes to technology choices, uh, we are we are very pragmatic. So we we have been sort of investing in DVB-H because we have see, seen that potential be there, and in that way uh, are very committed to make that standard happen. Uh, but having said that, if there is one, if there is another standard in mobile communications that would happen in a meaningful way, uh, we of course would take the business opportunity. <laughs> And, and invest in, in that one as well. So it, this is not a sort of a holy war in any way between different technologies or standards. It's, it's a pragmatic business decision where to invest. And uh, if you look at sort of our strategy overall, all markets, all price points, all consumer segments, high market share, if there is a relevant market <laughs> that is worth investing, we will, we will do that and very much applicable to mobile TV as well. Uh, hello, my name is Sorin Sismas. I'm with Mobiligen. Uh, I have a question about the Symbian deal. Uh, do you see it as an offensive or defensive deal that was made? Uh, thank you for the question, because I, I, give the, I get the opportunity to say that. I, I would almost say that the boldness of that move is a good illustration of the fact that you know, it's, not, it's not defensive. 
at all. It's, it's a proactive move uh, that, uh, that uh, happens at a time when we are seeing the smartphone market really sort of becoming very, very meaningful, uh, something that, uh, that needs to be looked at very carefully. And, and we definitely felt at this point of time that the, the, the a proactive move here, making Symbian open, bigger, better, faster, as, as I said, is, uh, is, is that's the right time here. And uh, it's also a philosophical quest question as well. I mean, I was speaking about the, 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 the openness. It's very much in our DNA. And uh, we felt that, you know, this is time to, to extend that fully also to, to the operating platforms. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are different opinions here in the audience, uh, but I'm saying uh, my, my, my thinking here is very clear. A proactive move that, uh, of course, is, is then something that is important when it comes to competition as well, but not, not something that would have been a reaction to something like I'm sure you are referring to Android as an example. Well, uh, let me ask a follow-up before we get yes. to the next question. We've uh, really neglected asking you your thoughts on Microsoft. Um, wh where does Microsoft really play here? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Do you ever see yourself as a future, you know, future partnership with them? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting... Steve Ballmer, who was here last week, yeah. still has spies in the room, so... Yeah, we'll... that's what I, that's what I'm... <laughs> you know, when I'm saying I'm, I'm, I may not be too popular in the Valley, but I, I, I say don't count them off. That's, that's my opinion. I think there's, there's a lot of sort of expertise, a lot of intellect, a lot, a lot of sort of raw energy there at Microsoft. And, you know, we, we look at them as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a competitor, of course. When it comes to Windows, they are supporting a competing operating system there, which, uh, which uh, is not both open and mature. <laughs> like I said, it is not both of them. And, and in, in that, but definitely a competitor. I, I believe we need to be able to coexist, meaning cooperate and compete uh, with Microsoft. And that, that's been the thinking all along. And uh, I think that's, 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 that's the way to go. We are definitely competitors. At, at the same time, I'm not excluding any, any, any uh, and it, at the same time, it's very clear that we will, we have coexisted, we will coexist, uh, coexist, and it, it is, it was only, only, only two weeks ago, I think, when, when, when we announced a, a cooperation deal with Microsoft when it comes to mail for exchange, we will, we will put that, uh, that client in, in our, in our Series 60 devices, and, and we will, in fact, exceed the earlier reference to RIM, the RIM volumes here in a matter of some months when it comes to mobile phones, devices out there with a, with a sort of a, 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 a very good sort of email, email solution here. So it's, it's coexistence matter. And I, I, again, I, re, I respect them a lot. I, I might take my whole hat off again here. So it's, I'm here with a very sort of humble mind. Well, RIM volumes are one thing. RIM margins are quite another. Uh, yes. No, no, yeah, well said. <laughs> Hi, OPK. Uh, my name is uh, Curtis, and my question is, over the long term, how do you see dedicated clients versus web services, and how you see the revenue mix changing over the same period, Sorry, no, over it's the long the term? Echo. echo is quite bad here. Sorry. Oh. Um, Did you hear that? My question is, uh, how do you see, over the long term, dedicated clients versus web services, and how you see the revenue mix changing over the same long term? The, what's changing? The, uh, the, the revenue Web mix? services is a, is a part of your revenue. How do you see that changing over time? Web yeah. services versus dedicated clients over the long term, your outlook, and how you see the revenue mix changing. Revenue mix, okay, that was, the, that, was, that was the word I was missing, sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, I, I, I better not, not, not really, uh, really estimate on the revenue mix, but it's of course very clear that, you know, the services part here, we mean business. And it's, it's, it's very clear that, you know, if you, if you company of our size, if we start like, like investing in, in, in something new, the ambition level needs to be quite high. And, and it is high. And, and, 
and it's very important to understand here, we are not in the services part in order to support something else, meaning like the rest of the business. We are in the services part in order to, to create a meaningful business and, uh, and, and in that way the assignment to the people sort of responsible for, for that type of activity, it's very clear. You make this a business as opposed to be a support to something and, and this mindset is extremely important here. Uh, we, we are betting on both and in a, in, a major, in, in a major way, but we have not announced any revenue, revenue uh, ratios or, or, or targets here as of yet when it comes to the services part. We have a couple more here and here, and then we'll do maybe a couple after that, Karen, and then uh, that'll, be, that'll be good, since okay. you uh, travel a zillion miles a year, and who knows what time zone you're in now. You... Oh, good day. Um, my name's Stephen Goh. Um, I'm also from the other side of the planet, from Australia. Um, we're in a company called MiG33. We're a mobile community of um, just over 17 million um, users. Um, one of the things that's excited us about this space is the, um, we see many parallels to the mid-1990s with the decay of AOL and CompuServe and the excitement to create new consumer experiences and new applications in a, in a, I suppose in a, in a, in a post-walled garden world. Um, what do you think the operator's positions are in regards to what is happening in the um, post-walled garden world? And also with Nokia also making investments and um, delivering services, um, consumer experiences, of, of a software nature um, through the handsets, how do you see balancing that and also the, with the, um, the application community? Yeah, that's of course a very good question and, and, and really sort of something that we have been thinking a lot. And uh, it's quite clear, and I, I think it is fundamentally important here to understand that when I, when I have said openness several times tonight, we really mean it. And that, that means that, uh, that uh, our, 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 our devices, our systems, our uh, OS is open to everybody else to put the applications on top of that. And, uh, and, and then we are not, when it comes to our operator relationship, we believe in the openness as well. And uh, we believe that in fact Nokia services and operator services can coexist uh, sometimes. Uh, but the main thing here is we are going to the market uh, when it comes to our services business in cooperation with the operator community. They've got a lot of assets we don't have. And I think the best possible illustration here of this fact is the fact that we have now announced agreements uh, with uh, Vodafone, Telefonica, T-Mobile, FT, Orange and Telecom Italia when it, when it comes to cooperating in, in the services space. And uh, I would almost claim that, you know, if all of the leading European operators so far have, uh, have agreed to cooperate with us in this, in this space, we must have something to bring to the table. Uh, and uh, because it's, it's quite clear that otherwise, you know, this type of sort of almost, uh, almost sort of, un uh, almost like unanimous <laughs> Like, like of approach from the European operators would not have happened. We have been investing a lot in services. The OS acquisition I referred to a moment ago is, is an important part of that. But we've gone even that far. We bought Navtech for $8 billion in order to get the sort of navigation digital maps assets to support our location-based services. And this is something, this is a good example of, 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 of the kind of stuff we can bring to the table. And when it comes to your reference to vault gardens and, and whether it's closed or not, I think there's quite a lot of understanding now globally in, in the minds of everybody active in this business, be them operators or not, that the amount of the task here, amount of the opportunity, amount of the challenge is so big that it's very difficult for anybody to do that in a very closed manner. And uh, I think the, what I said about the cooperation co co agreements very much speaks to that point. So it's, it's, co it's coexist, cooperate, and, uh, and, 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 and partner very much. We'll take three more. I have them identified. This gentleman, this woman who's been patiently waiting here, and we have one here. We have a fourth. Okay, Th those will be the last four. 
Um, and so fire away. Okay, uh, Mark Miller, Tabula. Uh, my question is, uh, with respect to software and services, to what degree are you going to be leveraging, taking advantage of a closeness to Nokia Siemen networks? And or as opposed to, to what degree, since they're a joint venture now, are you going to treat them as more and more independent? Yeah, the, the Nokia Siemens networks is, 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 is a 50-50 a joint venture with Siemens, between Siemens and Nokia, where we, that, that we are consolidating when it comes to the top, top line. And, 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 and in, in that way, we, we are more like having the management uh, responsibility for that. But having said that, it's quite clear that when it comes to our services uh, approach and, and, and the way we look at that, NSN Nokia Siemens Networks is, is quite far from that consume, consumer services part of the business. And in, in that way, in this regard, it's more like, more like a more independent, <laughs> independent unit, if you will. Yes. Well, this woman's been waiting a long time, so okay. why don't we go here? Then we'll go to the young man over here. Hi, I'm Nancy Benovich Gilby. I'm from Assurian. We're the largest uh, protection provider for both handset insurance and mobile data protection. Um, I'm very interested to hear what openness means from your perspective because there's a lot of talk about openness in the operating systems from a development point of view, um, but yet innovation really happens with true openness. Can um, software developers for example, replace the address book on a Symbian platform, and is that kind of openness going to be provided so that we can really come to an innovation and user experience on the Symbian platform? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for the question, and thanks for sort of for your comment as well, because I completely agree with you on what, on, on what you said, and that's why I wanted to make the point about the openness quite, quite, quite strongly early on, because I believe there are no hooks there are no disclaimers. There, there's nothing when it comes to Symbian that would make it closed in any way. It's as open as, as it, it, it possibly, be, uh, possibly can. Nokia is not in control. It will be controlled, controlled by the Symbian Foundation based on the rules uh, in, in, in there. And uh, I think your point about, about you know, the developer community and, and, and the open, importance of openness is absolutely correct. And, uh, when it comes to Symbian, I, we, don't, we will not need more openness. We will need more mindshare, and uh, that, because that's the area where I think we are trailing at the moment when it comes to some competing operating systems. It's quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite easy to see that, you know, when it comes to mindshare in the U.S. and especially here in the Valley, uh, the App Store and, and, and Android have much more mindshare less openness, more mindshare, and now we need to, I think the mindshare question here is, it will be easier to tackle, and, uh, and, and that's, what we, what, that's what we will do going forward. Well, you need to rename one of your lieutenants, Sergey Brin, and then you may get more mindshare. Uh, yes, Thank so you, right. yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Adam Bowengel. I'm with uh, Sumobi. My question is, if you could sort of snap your fingers and add a feature or capability uh, to the lives of all the people that have mobile devices, Nokia and otherwise, uh, and it would be here tomorrow. Um, what would it be? Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's a that's that's a very good question. Of course, uh, one feature or capability or application. You know, I would. I understand the point you are making. I understand the question, but still, I would like to take the opportunity here to answer in a, in a bit wider way and say, adding context to internet, which, 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 which can be sort of location-based, people-based, where you are, where you, you will be, who are your friends, what are they doing at the moment, and in that way making, adding that element to internet, context, people and places, that it is the great, that is the next big opportunity here. And uh, I think something that uh, will change internet quite a lot. And uh, that's, the, that's the possibility here. That's, that's in the core of what we are doing. And uh, in that way, it's not one feature, it's not one ap application, it's something more. We'll make this the last question. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Greg Tsar from Cross Pacific Capital. And the question is related to 
uh, M&A strategy. First of all, thank you very much for your active M&A. We need some out here. Uh, and, and wanted just to get a general understanding, you've acquired some large companies. Would you also, in your future goal to become stronger in America, look at acquiring some early stage companies if they had uh, that good value added services for American targeted operators? Yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, even, uh, even going forward, we have acquired quite a bit, not extensively, but, you know, at, le at least we acquired quite a bit here. And I believe that will continue. Uh, the the, the NAC, NAVTEC acquisition was, was rather big. It was a lot of content as opposed to services related. At the end of the day, digital maps are content. Uh, th that might be an exception when it, comes to, when it comes to size and the content element. But you know, when it comes to technologies, skills, people, even markets, Yes, early states, even later, <laughs> later states. Yeah, definitely, we will do some of that. And you have an active venture arm here, too, and that, we, fur uh, that furthers that effort. Yeah, and that is right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well represented today, tonight. And yes, that, that's a very, in, very much sort of in, in the core here as well. And uh, has been for 10 years our sort of Valley, Silicon Valley arm, and will continue to be one of the arms going forward. Well, let's give a warm thanks for uh, Oli Pekka Kassadur. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a long time. Just want to say thank you again to Oli Pekka. We wish you the best and certainly rich for this very thoughtful discussion, frank and thoughtful, and we truly appreciate your appearance here tonight. Uh, as a small gesture of thanks, you will be receiving the traditional Churchill Club t-shirts <laughs> to add to your t-shirt collection. Thanks again to Forum Nokia, and thank you all for coming. See you soon.